Good evening and welcome back to Listen Here, our Wednesday week, weekly opportunity to talk about music. And I'm delighted to have you all back on either YouTube or Facebook. And joining me tonight, of course, is Rafael Payari. Welcome, Rafael. Thank you. Thank you very much. And welcome, everybody, to another episode of our conversation, weekly conversation, as Martha just put it. So tonight, um, we're Take, come, we're going from Vienna with um, Beethoven to St. Petersburg and Tchaikovsky, another great symphonist. And uh, I discover, discovered that Tchaikovsky in his very short autobiography talked about his relationship with Mozart and then also with Beethoven. If you don't mind, I'd like to share this with you. Um, he said, I would play through my beloved Don Giovanni over and over again, or rehearse some shallow salon piece. From time to time, though, I would set about studying a Beethoven symphony. How strange this music would cause me to feel sad each time and made me an unhappy person for weeks. From then on, I was filled with a burning desire to write a symphony, a desire which would erupt afresh each time that I came into contact with Beethoven's music. However, I would then feel all too keenly my ignorance, my complete inability to deal with the technique of composition and this feeling brought me close to despair. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful way, very Tchaikovskyan way to put things. <laughs> yes, indeed. Emotion worn on his sleeve, as a matter of fact. But uh, he got over, he may not have gotten over his despair, but he certainly got over his intimidation and was one of the great symphonists of all times. Um, and also, I think, uh, you'll hear tonight the conversation about him also as an operatic composer and that some of his best operas are symphony. So it goes along with that sort of melodrama that we just heard in his writings. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And you could, I mean, having a little glimpse on his, on what he wrote about himself, you could kind of feel it, how it, why it touches so deeply whenever we are hearing his music or playing or conducting his music, which is very, not interesting, but kind of rewarding in a way to being able to be in that kind of flow is, is great. Well, and also it brings up vulnerability as a, as a musician, as a performer, as a composer, uh, this kind of standing as it were at the foot of genius and feeling inspired. And I, I think that also comes across in his music. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, one of the things tonight that you talk a lot about, and that's really so fascinating as well, is the range of dynamics. So that kind of goes again back to melodrama, but um, we'll look forward, I'll let you tell that story when we get into the program, but uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to understand just the reach of the emotional communication that he brings to his music. And tonight, of course, we'll feature two of the musicians from the San Diego Symphony Orchestra. So why don't we get started with the first movement? The old story, which I remember weeping over in my childhood book of music. Oh, poor man, he was so upset. He wrote this sad piece of music and then he killed himself. No, he didn't. It's true that Tchaikovsky died in the autumn shortly after the premiere uh, of this symphony, but he wrote the symphony Nine months earlier, Tchaikovsky knew when he wrote this piece that he'd written, well, he said in a letter to one of the members of his family, he said, I think I've written the best piece of my life. And he was very, very, we know that he was a very self-critical man, but part of that came from the fact that he wrote extremely fast. I was looking at the dates because one of my most, um, precious musical possessions which I have right here on my study floor is the manuscript sketch of the pathetic symphony and it's got it's got dates in it and do you know I don't know you maybe you knew this Raphael but he started the first movement on the 4th of February which was a Thursday in 1893. And on Tuesday, the 9th of February, he writes, first movement done, thank God. 
exclamation mark. He always put, he wrote, Slava Tibia Gospodi, thanks be to God. He then sketch, spent one day sketching the march and scherzo, and he didn't like the results. It's got, I've got it here in the, in the sketch. It's full of lines and crossings out. And then he wrote the first rough draft of the last movement, the, the famous one, everybody goes, oh, you know, he's so sad or whatever. He wrote that last movement in a day and a half. Exactly. And yeah. it's hilarious. At, after the waltz, he writes this message to himself, I did it. And then again, he says, Slava to be a gospody, thanks be to God. The whole short, the whole partizal is the word, German word he uses, is done. He approached every job because he was a professional. Every job had its own demands. And he'd known for some time that he wanted to write a big, melodramatic, dramatic, tragic symphony. The first music he wrote down is the beginning of the fast music at the, after the slow introduction of the first movement. And that was really clear to him. And you can see he makes lots of different versions of this. And then he pulls three different tricks in this first movement, which I find really fascinating. The first trick is that in the uh, original version of in the original short score that I have here in the sketches, he goes It just goes seamlessly on. And then when he revised it, he puts three more notes in it. He makes the line go further up and he puts a note to himself, NB, be careful, remember to do that when you come to orchestrate it. But when he orchestrated it, he had a third idea and he thought, nope, we will stop the line. What is the effect of that for you when you're on stage with that? It's such a brilliant idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's fantastic because it gives you suspense. It is, um, he put you on a hold and you are like, by the shares, like, what is going to happen next? What is going to be, I mean, you are longing for, to hear what is going to be, it's like leaving a, a question mark. What is in there? I mean, and, and we know his whim and we know that he was very whimsical and he had the abilities to do, as you said, as a professional composer, he could do all of these things. But what is beautiful for the symphony and the way with his head works is that it was about his mood at the time. Like like you said, he, is, he started with this melody in the Allegro and it's like, okay, I am in the mood to do this and let's put that and then he orchestrated it in a different way and then he put a little bit more dramatic and he expanded and then he used the orchestra. And I mean, the dynamic range of this symphony goes from six piano. I mean, we have piano and pianissimo and sometimes piano pianissimo, which will be triple piano. He used six of them and he put it to the bassoon, for Christ's sake. Six, and he go from six pianissimo to six fortissimo. I mean, it's, the range is so vast, so um, enormous, and it's his way of portraying absolutely everything. And it was a man that he knew how to uh, write a melody and get the melody like an earworm, you know? Like it's going to get, and you are going to understand that, and it's going to become part of you. You will, you will feel that that melody you have known all your life, that is like a lullaby that you have in, 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 in the back of your head for, forever. And then he stretched it out and put this most amazing uh, orchestration and makes you go through different stages of, um, grieving and it's like very personal and then he goes completely out there and then goes back and it's it's beautiful because of course everybody has their own way of seeing it but of course first movement how how you get this melody but how he orchestrated how he start with pianissimo with the violins then he used the violin with the cellos and then he used violin cellos with viola and the basses and he just go more more and then put the horns the wood with all together and it's every single time it's like Okay, I'm going to tell you a secret is very personal. And the moment that you enter in his world of secret, it's so vast. So it's, um, I adore his whim, you know? Yeah, yeah. Because I think he could somehow manipulate the listening, 
the listener to actually get into what he's trying to say. It's like, I'm going to tell you this, yes. I'm going to tell you this again. But now understand what I'm telling you, because if you see it this way, you understand that it's more than it's just as something that a little scratch. It could be something that is deeper, or it could be something that it isn't. Yeah, it's a... Uh, yeah, well, I mean, Tchaikovsky is one of my, my, one of my passions and one of my loves as well. I cannot say that I have only one, but, but you know, it is one of those that it is always hit you and, 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 and embrace you and do empathetic. It's, it's, it's always a, a wonderful ride on roller coaster of emotion uh, that it's uh, um, exhausting, but it's so wonderful to do it and come back at the end of the whole thing and live through all of that. It's always so rewarding. It's uh, it's great. Yeah. I like those words you used about it being personal and also his whim. This does not seem like the same man that wrote. He didn't know how to even approach writing a symphony. This yeah. is, you know, this is his his gift to tease you out of it, as as it were. Absolutely, and his way of also to be melodramatic about something of a wonderful talent that he knew that he had and that he could kind of um, spin around in different in different ways. It's, um, yeah, I love Tchaikovsky. <laughs> <laughs> Have you conducted all of the Tchaikovsky symphonies? Yes, yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah, from Winter Dreams to the Pathetic, yeah, it's, um, the third one is also is always a little bit Polish. It's a, a, a little bit more complicated for for people to like it because it's the more let's say it has structure per se. It has wonderful melodies in, inside, and, and and I think it was his trying a little bit of his craftsmanship. Like I really can do this, you know, like going into different stages. So it's it's. It's in between being a ballet and and, and, and symphonies, but then you have four, five, six. And, but, um, uh, well, yeah. um, we're going to talk about dance in a few minutes, but you're right to bring up the ballets, which people know, of course, so well. Um, today, we're going to hear from Kyle Covington, our principal trombone. And he's very personal about the experience of being on stage, what goes on in the, in the mind of a musician. And it, we were talking a little, teasing that out a little bit earlier with you know, Tchaikovsky's own um, talking about what it was like to what it is like to be a composer. Imagine all those ideas flooding your mind as you look at the blank page, or as you're on the stage with your colleagues making uh, or uh, performing a symphony. So, Kyle comes to us from a faraway place and a very interesting acoustic for the part of um, of his excerpt that is performed. But we'll we'll leave that as a surprise. So um, let's hear from Kyle Covington. I'm sure you know, as uh, a fellow um, principal brass person, you have to make a lot of sound, and there's a lot riding on the sound that you and maybe one other person, maybe two other per people are, 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 are making. Yeah. And so it's, uh, if I think about it too much, it probably won't go very well. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think I enjoy the softer parts the chorale parts more mainly because it's easier to be heard I find that uh, modern string sections these days often get a little excited when they hear loud brass instruments behind them <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know and we uh, maybe try to overplay each other a little bit so that isn't so much fun but uh, the softer parts where you can be more expressive and uh, have just more opportunity for a dynamic contrast is more fun, I think. There probably was a point where I was afraid of the last part, the soft part at the end. Because as, as you know, a lot of people might not know that playing very softly on a brass instrument after playing very loudly for a long time can um, get inside of your head and, and make it quite difficult. Uh, so that used to be the case, but not anymore, thankfully. <laughs> for sure, not anymore. Um, for sure, not anymore. I mean, you know, 
I've never had the ability to remember individual concerts. Um, they're kind of all smashed together <laughs> in my head. And it's this one big concert. And often I found a long time ago, I've discovered to maintain sanity. It's often healthy to erase the concert as soon as it's over fr right. from your memory. Just <laughs> hit, hit the button and go beep and delete it. Good. All right. Yeah, I, I can't do that at all. <laughs> <laughs> In the heat of a concert, there's just so many things going on and so many possible thoughts and or things to remember and it's just too much it's like sensory overload yeah. so you know <laughs> and you have to perform or sit there for a very long time and pay attention and then perform <laughs> right okay. so or actually i think what i enjoy about your conducting in general is that um you never let the pulse go it just it, there's always something underlying and um i think from what i can observe you seem to do it with your breath you can you conduct with your whole body and it starts with your breathing um which is i mean everybody breathes right even string players breathe yeah for sure they don't, yeah. they, don't <laughs> they, they, also they, they also need to breathe to play but they don't need to blow into their instrument to play but they still need to breathe to play And I think a lot of conductors who become conductors through through playing like a piano or just don't, they, that's something that they don't understand. I think that's very special and it makes every concert so much easier. So thank you. No, thank you. I'm happy to, to yeah, that's, that's a very nice compliment. Thank you. That, that wasn't the idea of this, but. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a barn or a massive warehouse I that Kyle's in. Yeah, it looks like it. <laughs> Good, a nice big practice room, very resonant. Um, before I before we go on, I just want to remind you that the chat box is open, or uh, you can ask us questions. Uh, we'd love to hear from you and answer your direct questions uh, as part of our conversation tonight. So please don't forget to do that. Um, As we go to the second movement, um, I'm thinking of last week and talking about Beethoven and the Lendler, um, kind of the German dance. And now we're in St. Petersburg, but we talked a little bit about Tchaikovsky as a ballet composer. Uh, obviously, very famous ballets. Everyone hears the Nutcracker at Christmas, of course, in San Diego, but um, so many others. So have you conducted any of his ballets? No, only a suite, actually. I haven't been on, on a pit and doing ballet music per se, but, you know, Sleeping Beauty and these things, you have some suites and you do it here and there. How is that the same or different from the symphonies? Oh, um, when you do the suites per se as a, in a symphonic concert, it's, uh, I mean, the music itself, it has a certain structure and you have some freedom. When you do it in the pit, It's different because it's not only what you're doing actually on your own, but you have to have the pace for the uh, dancers to actually have their, their the rhythm that they have been practicing for months. Uh, so it has to be a little bit more in, in, in a way um, strict. I don't want to say, you know, contempt, but a little bit more strict when you have, when you're actually in the pit to have it, especially if you're going to do some kind of classic uh, ballet, you cannot go crazy with, with, with tempo per se, because then you could uh, um, get on the way of the dancers. 
I had a very good friend who was a dancer and a choreographer, and he we worked together because he really wanted his dancers to be able to perform with live music. To perform with recordings, he said, was the problem was you always knew exactly where to put your foot or put the gesture. But if it was live music, you would have to adapt slightly. Um, and it gave the dancer uh, just that much more, a slightly more risk and more energy. I was I always remembered his observation about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be, I mean, it could be like a roller coaster for them because if they are wonderful and they are in the zone, it's great. But if they are having a little bit of hesitation and then the music is not there, it could uh, work a little bit in the head and then that could not go too well, but yeah. It's also interesting what Kyle said about breathing and, and talking about the importance of breath for any any performer. Um, and I think also that that uh, Rolantando or that slight pause for a dancer in the same way. It's kind of like that inhale or that that waiting waiting for the breath in a way. Yes, absolutely. It's a, and it has to do with the physical part of everything. I mean, for us, when we breathe, it's like the upbeat, the preparation before we're actually going to give the beat. So for the dancers, it's also the way they could relax and the way they could actually do certain physical part that they need to do and how they manage to put it down. It's, it, it's a, a completely different world, a wonderful one. Right? So the second movement takes us to the waltz, but it's, it's an unusual waltz. And we hear first, I think, from Yao Zhao, our principal cellist. In the second and third movements, you have a waltz which is not quite a waltz because it's in the wrong rhythm for a waltz, but nobody could think it was anything but a waltz. Tell me about this rhythm. Yeah, it's a wonderful, um, unusual rhythm for a waltz. It's a 5-4, which, um, strangely enough, in Venezuela, our merengue is a 5-4. So we have this kind of um, uh, almost limping kind of rhythm that we do have it, but it's a waltz, it's a, an, an absolute waltz, and he had this ability of writing melodies, so he uses the cellos and the style. <laughs> And in the meantime, you have the woodwinds trying to do as a slightly contrapoint or that is go crazy. Sometimes as, as a conductor, to put that together sometimes, it is kind of complicated because you have the and you have this all the time kind of moving that you never uh, cannot hear when it's like the first beat. So sometimes you just have to get into the flow and once you get the flow, you will never forget. You just start waltzing. Well, Tchaikovsky, to me, it's a very interesting composer. Um, obviously, he's as romantic as uh, a composer can be. And talking about the Sixth Symphony, I, I guess it's the second movement or all Tchaikovsky's second movement, four, five, and six. The second movement has a huge cello soli or cello melody line. And they're all very, very different. And this particular one, to me, it's one of the hardest because it's so far apart from the rest of the piece. The first movement is very dark. This third movement is very, in a way, angry. I was reading articles about people where he wrote something about being disappointment. And the last movement is being something about death. And then we have this beautiful, light-hearted um, second movement as a dance. And the lines for Tchaikovsky, of course, we know that um, he used the cello very much and the cello having the voice that it has is great. And with the melodies, everything is so, so, so wonderful. When we were talking about Shostakovich, I always thought that Shostakovich's um, cellos and basses were the inner thought of him. But with Tchaikovsky, he knew how to use it um, the way he used the human voice, but in the orchestra, he puts the melodies to the cello. So, I, I'm, I mean, I don't know how it is to play it, but I mean, you can you can tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. They're all hard, as I said, with a nice melody line there, and the hardest part for it is also to keep the line going. Uh, Always try to stretch um, a longer line so the whole sentence finishes, rather than saying word by word. Right. right. 
technically, of course, none of them are easy. You know, if we go to really technical, how you keep vibrating, how much vibrato you use, how little you use, you know, that we can talk about it for days. But I have a question, actually. Do you, uh, looking at the whole symphony, um, with the second movement stuck in the middle, are you, do you think he's thinking back through his life, a different period of his life? I think so, yes, absolutely, because it's it's a little bit like having um, a remembrance of how everything goes, you know? You have this roller coaster, you have this emotion, especially the first movement that you go from six piano to six fortissimo, that you have this whole roller coaster, and then it's a little bit like, um, especially how it ends the first movement, like it's a little bit it is you know it's okay you have that kind of feeling that you're already grounded then you get into the second movement and you enter this beautiful almost like um how you live your life around in luxury and beauty and 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 and, and having all this kind of thing then you have the march of course that is a completely different thing and you get in this in here and, and even though you could even dance it and you could even put a choreography in it you get this amazing and you remember how we did um um the concert that we finished the march and the of course the audience went crazy for an applause and we immediately start the fourth and i was really aiming that actually would happen you know it was very effective and people needs to to understand just when you're at the highest point all of a sudden something hits it yeah. stops right there and it's wonderful and it's great that i remember ben asking me it's like um are we going to do this attack because the people is going to to applaud and it's like i really hope they do it's what is fantastic especially because you got that rush and it's like wow immediately in one split of a second and nowadays how we could see how we're all the whole world not only you know my life and the single individual but the whole world how we, in one second we've just been put on hold everything is switched around exactly yeah. and the, and the yeah. audience is part of all of that it's wonderful i love it when because the, yes. it becomes something that you have this kind of synergy going it is it's, it's great it's really a shock yeah to the world yeah. exactly yeah. and earlier we were talking about the dynamics for the first movement from six pianos to all of a sudden I guess 24 days or I, I don't remember exactly but that that's sort of the idea but the second movement also what's hard for us it starts as mezzo forte so that's sort of right in the middle of nowhere how do you start how loud do you play it's obviously not so outgoing that's it's a forte and it's not so soft so it's not timid so to really um, put a good measure to that also as a section that's always one of the things we um, are thinking about while playing that in the in a section just talked about this idea of line, the sustained sound and, and phrase. And um, Kyle talked about you're always keeping this pulse. And then we talked about dance and talk a little bit more about that, that tension between the, the lyrical and the pulse underneath. How, does, how do you as a conductor um, connect those two? Um, I mean, you will always have to have the, the pulse itself. It's like having the blood, the heart rate that you could always have through your veins. And at the same time, while your blood mainstream is doing that to your heart, you are kind of speak and you could do something. So in, in, with the orchestra, it's a little bit like that. We have the pulse that is actually what could connect one thing with the other or could, could actually um, disrupt a phrase. When we talk about line, it's like... A, for instance, we have one phrase and we call a phrase um, a melody per se, that it comes from one point to the other. 
the way how you, with the pulse being intense in between, that's what the tension that we say in between the notes, that we could um, speak the message from the beginning to the end of the phrase or the sentence itself without making, um, let's say, unexpected kind of pause or things, uh, or you could make an accent that will not belong into whenever you speak. I mean, when you put it in a way, the way we talk, even though I have a strong accent in English, my apologies for that, but it, it will have to have a line and an idea to actually have to make people understand what you're saying. So in music, it's exactly the same, but with notes. It's not just uh, a bunch of notes one after the others, but you have to create a proper line and phrase to actually being able to say something in a way that it, everybody could understand. And at the same time, you have the pulse that it's um, like the blood, that, that the life is just underneath, that it can stop. The moment it stops, it's... Uh, dies you know it's like when you stop having blood into your heart so you will have a heart attack or, or something. Yeah. so it's also a little bit about breathing too i mean as you said there's the heart pulse but the breath and extending that line if it's a sentence or if it's a melody or whatever and the longer you extend everybody's almost waiting for you when when are you going to take the breath right that kind of tension Exactly, exactly. And sometimes, well, we could have, a, we were talking about Beethoven, sometimes the silence itself, that breathing becomes part of the music and you need that kind of tension to say something um, in a different way or to create a question mark or to actually make a point even in a stronger way. And that's why the, the ability of this amazing composer that we have been talking, they have this way of doing it without, um, well, some of them, uh, as you just read from Tchaikovsky said that he didn't think that he could do it in a symphony, but clearly he, he could. And, and we are you know, thankful to go to that because we could enjoy his way of expressing anything, any kind of, um, you don't need to know Russian to know how uh, he, if he's feeling happy or in despair or, or it's very sad, it's, it's great, his way of connecting to, to people's heart and, and mind. I like the fact that you talked about the silence, um, the use of silence in a piece or as a conductor creating that tension of silence that then goes into sound. Obviously music is, is sort of on, on a bed of silence uh, and um, it's so dramatic. So we have two questions from our watchers. One is a little bit like that. It is about the sound um, the dynamics we were talking about. How do you convey dynamics? How do you convey, of course the players have the, you know, six times piano in the part, but how does your gesture change from that kind of dynamic to a, you know, quadruple forte? Um, it depends. Um, sometimes, of course, it's going to be a little bit strange if it is something that is very soft and my gestures get bigger that will create a little bit disrupted for, for the musician itself. But um, one thing that it's also, um, let's say interesting for our, our audience to know is like Kyle mentioned, sometimes to play piano is one of the most difficult thing to do, to being able to, that the sounds is still completely alive, but it's actually softer, like a hush. I mean, we even experience it whenever we want to say a secret, and then if you are talking and you your voice could get a little, <coughs> and then you, <coughs> oh, sorry, and then you whisper. To have that kind of thing in the instrument is always a little bit complicated. So it depends. Sometimes, um, depending on the moment, and that's the, the beauty when we are on the stage, that we create that kind of connection with the eye. And you could see if the musician it's feeling absolutely comfortable and it could go softer, or you could see that if it's a little bit tense, then you encourage to play a little bit more because it's important. The dynamic itself, for me, it's a color. It's not about like when you have volume and you could have, you know, put 10, 8, 6, 5. No, no, it's about a color and how you could say it. The, if you could speak that the people could hear, but it's in an intimate way, it doesn't mean that you just have to play at volume one, but you could make it in a way playing with the color being called volume four, and it will still feel that it's very, very intimate and very, very close. So it's a, 
it's a dance <laughs> that it depends every single time and it depends on what is happening on the stage and what, what we do or what the composer actually intended. So, so as Buddha, yeah, with this Buddha, it's interesting <laughs> to talk about silence at this moment. Um, but what I was, what I was thinking about just as you were talking is as a composer, the empathy that you need and you know the score so well and you know what it takes for the individuals you know when it's a particularly difficult part for them yeah and you study it it's not just the notes and you have that you look at them as a big solo comes up and that connection gives them confidence do you is that how you work with our with musicians absolutely absolutely because i mean every musician is there and they want to give the best um, and of course, our wonderful musicians from the San Diego Symphony, they are phenomenal, they are virtuosic. Everybody has a, a, a technical ability to do whatever, but there are episodes that are more demanding than others. And, you know, it's um, when you are on the stage, you, are, you have the spotlight in a way, and you feel, I, I mean, I remember when I was playing in the Simon Bolivar Orchestra, when you were going to play a solo, you could feel how, even no one is there that you could feel almost like there's a light, a spotlight that it gets, goes to you because that's the moment that you need to play. So sometimes I, the encouragement, you need it, that you could see like, I know, you know, this is, this is a moment and you could just serve the platform, be free, speak up, you know. And if you sometimes something could happen, you know, we are human beings and instead of like you know like oh that was almost too beautiful it's like no 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 we we keep just that connection is very important for the musician to to feel that we could need to keep going because many things happen on stage and that becomes uh this kind of um, um uh, complicity you know that it, and it's a game and they for any musician on the stage they freer they feel, the better the result is going to be, like anything in life. Everything could blossom and everything will taste and, and look better, you know? That's a beautiful sentiment, actually. Um, so we'll go to the third and fourth movements together. And there's a good reason why listening to these two together without break is, um, is uh, appropriate. So let's continue to hear Tchaikovsky. In Tchaikovsky's day, people didn't dance waltzes so much. In the court, what they danced was polonaises, which adapt themselves quite quickly to um, march rhythms, of course. And then you have this wonderful scherzo, which is very, very which is very close in a way to Mendelssohn, to, to Berlioz, composers that he admired very, very much but also combined with it, and this is the only bit of the symphony he found really difficult to write, the combination of that scherzo music with this Polonaise march. Of course he had that trouble trying to put it together. He writes a restless uh, ternary, a binary thing per se, it's going to be a crash of it, and it has to be all the time, a little bit growing and growing and growing. And he uses, finally, in the symphony, he uses the Gran Casa as cymbal and the timpani as well. So he put the orchestra even into a bigger space. He develops this march in different ways many, many times. There's one one line that you think that like you are there. It's fantastic in the middle. The pom 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 I keep you think like, you reach the top and the and it's going it's absolute joy you could see the whole thing bam, and you have the, everything all together again growing for nothing from nothing from nothing from nothing then it gets really big really really big and there's the whole orchestra held by the timpani into a frenzy at the end. Bam, 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 bam. Timpani going completely. The joy, everything is like, this was the most joyful part of life, this whole thing. So everybody wants to clap. It's, it's wonderful because you have that rush and you do it. And I don't wait for the applause to go away. I dive in because it's like, life is great. Boom, the truth has arrived. He had this amazing fourth movement the way he, he just did it. It makes the whole thing more devastating and more real. And that's a, a, 
That's Tchaikovsky for you. I remember when I was a student in Moscow, which is 35 years ago, one of my old teachers there saying, what you have to understand is that Tchaikovsky was at his root a dramatic composer. But although he wrote some great operas, which are masterpieces, his greatest operas are his symphonies. If the first movement is ultimately drawn from vocal music, it's drawn from music which people sing, the middle two movements are both drawn from dance, from how people move. And then in the fourth movement, he goes back to singing again. So it's the voice, then the body, then the body, and then the voice. And to me, that is the most beautiful structure. It's, it's completely clear. There's, there's no question what we're doing. And looking again at these, these beautiful sketches that I have here, I found a fascinating thing in the second sketch because he did a quick version of the last movement before he went away. Then he came back. He did a couple of revisions in the first movement, including adding the beginning. The whole of the beginning was a very, that slow introduction was a very late thought and very clever thought, brilliant idea, dramatic idea. He then uh, quickly revised the last movement. And in doing so, he changed the melody and I was looking, because you can see it's really clear in the sketches how he crossed out what he'd done before. He's using a different colored pencil and he changes it to what we now know. And I thought, what, is, what was he doing? Why did he want to change it? Because it was very beautiful the way it was before. And I suddenly realized what he was doing was bringing it closer to the big melody in the first movement. So he's trying to give the, this frame, this dramatic story, he's trying to make the, a connection between the beginning yeah, and the end. He had this amazing ability to actually show you and make you feel exactly what he wanted to say. It's, uh, it's, it's I mean, the, we have, I mean, this, this symphony is full of big climaxes, as we know. It's, it's all the time, but again, thinking in his programmatic way, trying to link one thing from the very beginning to the end. The big climax for the last movement it's just fantastic, just fantastic how he uses, you know, these strings like and then he makes them go in triplets. He start going double, then a little bit more, and then and he start pushing the tempo. He uses the horns and he puts Boucher, Quip, Gestop in the low register that is impossible for home players to play Gestop in the low register. It's, 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 I mean, to make it sound that it comes across is almost, you cannot just do it. And he uses it on purpose because it's like being grabbed by the throat and being squeezed your life. And, and he got the horn cutting. <laughs> And then he goes, I'm trying to reach him for that last grasp of air. The only time he uses in the symphony. Before getting at the very end again with that kind of heartbeat. Yum, pum, pum. And always basses and cellos, well, basses actually in a divisive way, having the heartbeat going, going, going until it kind of like fades out. Boom. Boom. Ends in the most wonderful niente, nothing to sound. And you could feel how it's like. This, this is what it, this is what I'm feeling. I want you to understand what I am feeling in this particular moment and how it could be the life could be so vast, so great, and at the same time it could be so dark and and, and, and with no future ahead. Ah, it's just fantastic. One of the most profound moments 
in music is the ending of that symphony. Um, and coming from the third movement, now we all know it's okay to applaud. So that was great. Absolutely, I count on that actually, I, I, I love it. it. It's also such a gut feeling that you just want to erupt in applause. It's fantastic, it's so Tchaikovsky in a way, but it's, yeah, I love it. I, th I think we should do a sampling of YouTube videos of 20 conductors conducting the end of the third movement into the beginning of the fourth. That would be fascinating. <laughs> it might be, it might be um, um, a little bit too crazy to watch. <laughs> <laughs> also true. So I have only one last question from our listeners and I know the answer to this. What is the first piece of Tchaikovsky you heard that made you love him? Ah, it was um, actually without knowing, it was um, 1812 Overture. My brother was playing a recording in, in, in his room and that was how actually one thing linked to the other. He was listening to something, I really like it. He said, do you like that? Yes, and then he took me to the orchestra and then that was why the kind of the French horn chose me and not the other way around. So yeah, yeah, but that was 1812 for sure which is probably a piece that um, everyone knows. It's hard to even say that everyone knows that best because there are so many of Tchaikovsky's works that are well known. But this past week uh, we had on KPBS the last year's Tchaikovsky Spectacular with of course the 1812 Overture um, that were performed last, last summer at Bayside Summer Night. So, so Raphael, next week we turn to Shostakovich, another composer near and dear to your heart. Um, and a piece that you conducted here in January of 2019, which as I remember was your first concert as music director designate, if I'm not wrong. Absolutely, yes. yes. And that's uh, Shostakovich's Symphony Number no. 10. Yes, uh, his reaction, it was actually performed after the death of Stalin in 1953. So that's, uh, that's also a roller coaster wonderful to explore and dig and, uh, and talk about. We look forward to next week. So please tune in through Facebook or subscribe to YouTube, our YouTube channel, and be here next week at 6.30 on Wednesday. And if for some reason you can't be with us, you know that you can view any of these uh, Listen Here programs on symphony, uh, sanicosymphony.org and on our symphony stream. We're so happy to have you with us and to enjoy this time with you listening to music and talking about music, which is what we know connects us. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Until next week, thank you for being here. <laughs>